Uh, the uh, problem that we're going to look at next is one that falls into um, category of distortions that occur in your common midpoint gathers and shot records. And these are referred to as static anomalies. They're associated with um, weathered zones uh, in the bedrock, bedrock irregularities, and also topographic relief variations along the profile. So you had an earlier period of um, weathering and erosion. You've got an irregular bedrock surface. You deposited sediments on top of that. And uh, then later on, you have uh, again have another period of erosion where you uh, produce some topographic relief along the uh, profile. And here you are collecting your seismic data. Your sources and receivers are at different elevations. You know that the travel time down to this flat reflector to this receiver is going to be uh, a little bit less perhaps than this one, but maybe not. We have this low velocity layer in here. We are further away from it. But these uh, different velocities, these different thicknesses, the thickness of the weathered uh, zone and so on, is an issue that we have to uh, resolve and calculate and remove from the source and receiver um, records in our common midpoint gather. So in general, the, the velocity model that we're working with is that the velocity of the weathered zone is less than the velocity of the bedrock, and it's less than the velocity of the underlying uh, formations beneath this uh, flat reflector. And we're using this flat reflector just to make it easy to visualize the effect of um, topography and uh, varying thicknesses of the this weathered zone, low velocity zone, low velocity layer. So we often refer to it or abbreviate it as uh, the LVL for low velocity layer. Now, ideally when you sort your sources and receivers into a common midpoint gather, you'd expect to see nice hyperbolic reflections from uh, flat layers, and uh, uh, after um, taking a look at the situation that we presented you with, you know that you're going to have some irregularities in this hyperbolic, um, the um, hyperbolic nature of the reflection due to changes in topographic relief and thickness of the LVL. So that when we go through that NMO correction, when we make the NMO correction, we're going to get um, a corrected reflection event, which is not entirely flat. It's not, it doesn't follow this ideal that we have. We have these undulations above and below uh, <clears throat> what should be a flat uh, reflection event. That's what we've, uh, w what we normally get when we're looking at uh, you know, the common midpoint uh, response. So we get a uh, flattening when we go through the NMO correction. So, However, since we have these uh, static features that are superimposed on the reflection event, you can see right away that when we go through this process of stacking to produce the stack trace when we go through this summation, that the events associated with this reflector are going to be out of phase. So they're going to, we're going to get some degree of destructive interference depending upon the, uh, the extent of the static and topographic, uh, the uh, uh, LVL and topographic uh, features along your profile. So this is not what we want to see in our uh, stack section. So we have, again, we have to um, come up with some means for eliminating this uh, static anomaly, this static uh, uh, feature in our, in our data. So let's take a look, uh, let's simplify the problem here. We've got the flat reflector. We, we assume that we went through the stacking process. We have uh, coincident uh, source and receiver 
uh, ray paths now, normal incidence ray paths. We've taken our field data, we've sorted it into common midpoint order, we've um, uh, gone through the stacking process, we calculated velocities and so on, and we, we um, uh, now have these coincident source and receiver records, and we're dealing, we're assuming that we're dealing with a flat um, uh, reflector. We've got a variable thickness, uh, you know, in the, in the weathered layer, we've got variable topography along the, the profile. And we realize um, that if we don't correct for the changes, let's say, in topography or the varying thickness of this low velocity layer here, that we're going to get some anomalous uh, travel times down to this flat reflector. It will no longer be flat. So we've got our coincident source and receiver ray tracing. We know that uh, we're further away up here. We've got a thicker low velocity interval. Uh, what's the combined effect going to, what's the combined effect going to be on the travel times to this um, a reflector? So what we're going to do is we're going to separate this out into two problems. We're going to take a look at the effect of topography here. Again, we'll just use this uh, normal incidence uh, ray tracing representation. The uh, static anomaly uh, that we're getting over here is pretty, pretty straightforward. I think we can see directly from the model over here that as we go up in the topography, as our uh, common midpoints uh, are located at higher topographic elevation, it's going to take us a greater amount of time to get down to this reflector. And um, likewise, as we go into this valley, the travel times are going to become less. And uh, we end up with this situation where we have an apparent structure here, syncline, anticline, in what is a flat reflector. And we will also see the same feature developed in deeper reflections that I haven't, haven't shown here, but uh, assume that we had a deeper flat reflector running through here. It would also have this superimposed um, uh, static travel time anomaly uh, superimposed on its reflection arrival times. And this gives rise to... Um, what a structural geologist would think of as harmonic folding. And it's not really that, that uh, common to, to see such um, regular harmonic folding uh, down through an entire section. So that's one of the giveaways. And another reason that this is called a static anomaly, static meaning unchanging, is that we tend to see the same kind of feature in the shallower and deeper reflectors. So we have um, a condition then which can be kind of a red flag for us or um, a signal that uh, indicates that we've got a problem, we've got static anomalies, that we're going to need to do some additional processing. We're going to have to get rid of the topographic effect and the weathering effect somehow. So the time shift is static. Um, this reflector one over here uh, has this superimposed structure on it that's associated only with the topography. We're assuming that we have a constant uh, velocity through this section. And likewise, these velocity variations, these travel time variations that we have in this uh, upper layer beneath the top topographic surface are also going to be superimposed on deeper reflectors. This time shift remains the same for all reflectors. So here we have a situation where, again, we're looking at the coincident source and receiver section, but we have a flat surface. We don't have any topographic relief. We have a varying thickness in the, uh, we have a var variation in the thickness of the weathered layer, the LVL. Again, the velocity in the weathered layer is assumed to be considerably less than the velocity in the underlying uh, uh, bedrock. And then here again is our flat reflector. So, so here is our um, weathered layer. Uh, what's the influence going to be on the appearance of this um, 
flat reflector? Well, here we're traveling through a greater thickness, um, so it's going to take a longer amount of time uh, to get down to this uh, reflector surface over here than it is over here over this high. I've, I've incorporated some refraction in here. If you were going to do the ray trace modeling uh, and actually calculate this out, you would have to uh, incorporate uh, refraction across the boundary of the weathered layer. So the question is, what are we going to see over here in our time section? Uh, after the um, topographic correction, the base of the LVL um, will still remain distorted, and it's going to retain the shape, in this case, of the weathered layer. Uh, we have smaller um, travel times through the thinner section of the weathered layer over here. We have uh, longer travel times over here in these valleys, and we tend to see that then uh, repeated or uh, superimposed on the travel times from this uh, deeper reflection event. So these corrections, uh, I think you can, you can see the importance of making these corrections uh, in, in, the, um, in the shot records, the CDP gathers and so on before stacking. In order to get, uh, in order to improve the signal to noise ratio that we, uh, that we ideally want to get from the process of stacking. Now, so we're going to be getting information about the thickness of the low velocity layer from our refraction surveys. And when, when we come down at a critical angle, we know as we go from low velocity to high velocity that we're going to begin, we're going to refract out along this um, low high velocity interface and the ray paths that come to the surface are going to be at uh, the critical angle uh, relative to the normal to the um, refractor surface. And we saw earlier when we worked the uh, refraction problem that we can determine what the uh, vertical thickness is, the vertical uh, thickness of the layer from the source or from the receiver down to the reflector surface is uh, in the analysis of our, our refraction data. Now if we did that, we'd basically find a thickness, um, an estimated thickness, uh, which would kind of follow the, this red arrow here. Uh, whereas the actual thickness, as you can see, is going to be uh, going to be greater. So you can see the potential for errors in the thickness of the low velocity uh, layer that we obtain from refraction data. So our kind of our question that we ask ourselves is whether we can assume that the ray path of length equals the vertical thickness of the LVL, and you can see that in fact it doesn't. And um, so what assumptions do we have to make? Uh, what conditions do we hope for, do we have to test for in the near surface environment in order to take this particular approach? That's one of the questions that we have to ask. And in this particular uh, case, this, the application for determining what the thickness of the uh, low velocity layer is, uh, if we make this assumption then, uh, we have to assume that the irregularities, the irregularities on the bedrock um, interface are fairly small so that these calculations of the uh, vertical thickness of the weathered zone from our refraction data will be, be fairly accurate. And um, we, can, we can make this assumption, you know, the assumption that the LVL, that the upgoing ray path through the LVL is nearly vertical. Um, we, can, we can do this if, if we, you know, if we're, we're thinking about um, seismic wavelengths of, uh, you know, are, are fairly large compared to the ir irregularities on the, t the uh, bedrock interface, then we can make this assumption, then it should be a valid assumption. And um, if you think about uh, the, well, let's say we have a velocity of 2,000 feet per second here in the low velocity layer. Um, 
and let's say we have a peak frequency or a dominant frequency of around 40 hertz, then you know we're looking at uh, features that are about 50 feet um, in in lateral dimension. So if we're so so the effect of the seismic wavelet, the seismic wavefront, and its frequency content tends to smooth out the refractor surface, the um, that we're propagating through. So that's a justification, uh, maybe a weak justification, one that you should definitely test out in your area before you apply this technique. Um, but this is an assumption that we'll be making and we'll uh, discuss this in more detail when we talk about the actual uh, correction process. So. Uh, think about what we've just covered here a little bit. Um, consider the assumptions that we're making. Consider the problem again. Uh, variable topographic relief, variable um, um, relief on the um, bedrock uh, weathered uh, interface, and exactly how you might go about uh, correcting, uh, removing. You know, basically what we want to do is we want to get rid of the topography. We want to get rid of the irregularities in the, um, well, in fact, we want to get rid of the weathered layer entirely. So if we have a, a weather velocity here and we have a V1 here, let's say, we want this entire section to have the, we want to simulate what travel times would be through this entire section if it were uh, defined by a single velocity V1 and there were no topography. So think over that a little bit and we'll come back to this next time.